Welcome, everybody. Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you may be calling in from. Um, we are going to give a few more minutes for people to arrive. So in the meantime, um, if you want to uh, type into the chat, I would love to start hearing how you're all doing. And just in the midst of so much uh, change and chaos and uncertainty in the world, I'd love to hear just anything that you want to share that that is either joyful or fun or inspiring that you've experienced in the last couple of weeks or a month. Just curious to hear where people have been, what you've seen, what you've experienced. You know, I turn on the news or even the social media feeds and so much of it is, is just about the, the kind of uncertainty and the anxiety and the, the fires, of course, for those of us out on this coast, but would love to hear some positive things that are present in people's lives today. So if you want to type into the chat, anything you want to share. Uh, Emily is saying fall is coming to the Great Lakes region. It is our most beautiful season. I, uh, I grew up in New England, so I definitely miss the fall. Miss the on time. Being in the Bay Area, it's like one season all year. So yeah, what else? Uh, in between organ fires, we're doing remarkably okay, but many are not. I always say Oregon has all the good parts of Michigan and none of the bad, but yeah. No, I definitely hear that too. I'm, I'm out in California and obviously the fires are, are burning pretty out of control and, and feeling really grateful and, and blessed and privileged to be okay through it all. Um, Elki is saying, my name is Elki, born in the UK, living in the Netherlands for 35 years. Excited to be here, a little tired after training all day uh, and wouldn't want to miss this. Thank you for being here from so far. I have no idea what time it is in the Netherlands, but thank you for your commitment. Um, working with a kind group of individuals and arriving at a solution that was compassionate and respectful. Really nice to hear people able to work through conflicts in healthy and, and respectful ways in a time when it feels like that's at such a premium. Um, for those of us, or for those of you that are arriving now, uh, we're just giving folks a few more minutes to arrive. And in the meantime, just sharing in the chat anything um, inspiring that you've experienced recently, anything joyful, um, even if you have a, a joke that you want to share or something that might just bring some inspiration and a smile onto people's faces in a time of such uh, chaos in the world. Uh, Joy says, I live in Canada. My heart goes out to those who are experiencing hardship regarding the fires. Thank you, Joy. Uh, I imagine there's probably a lot of us on the West Coast right now who's really feeling it. Um, yeah, Gabby got to spend some time with my two-year-old niece, who I don't see very often. She's amazing and calls, uh, calls me her friend. So precious. Absolutely. Two-year-olds, children in general. I uh, have a <laughs> six-year-old nephew that I have seen in too long. I'm hoping to visit him sometime. Um, hey, Liam says, I proposed to the love of my life during COVID. Congratulations to Liam. I also got committed during COVID myself. So there's, it's important to remember that there's, you know, in the midst of everything that is happening, there's still beauty, there's still life, there's still love. There's still lots of amazing things happening. Uh, someone says, working through hiring for a few positions in Yosemite and excited to see the enthusiasm and willingness to take this leap to working in a new place, essentially during this tricky time. Um, I would love to be out in Yosemite right now. I mean, I don't know how it is with the fires, but um, definitely missing nature a lot these days. Uh, very smoky here in BC, Canada from the Western US fires. Cannot see the mountains, but the sun is trying to break through the smoke. I take comfort. Uh, in that all things are impermanent and we will get this. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if this year has taught us anything, it is the truth of the reality of impermanence. So absolutely. I want to welcome some of the folks that are still joining us. And for the call today, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Leone in a few minutes, but we'll hear from Leone. And then I'll be making a few announcements about East Point. And then Leone is going to be leading us through a practice. Um, and then we'll have uh, kind of an official Q&A at the end, but I know Leone also is, uh, wants to invite folks to engage throughout the entire uh, duration of this call. And we'll go about 90 minutes or so. 
So I think with that, we'll uh, officially get started. Um, for those of you that I have not yet met, uh, my name is Kazu, and I'm a core member of the East Point Peace Academy. I want to welcome everyone for this call. Uh, really excited to have you all here and definitely excited to have Leone. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about East Peace Academy and the work that we're doing a little bit later, but uh, this is part of a series of calls that we've been having since COVID hit called Where Do We Go From Here? And just having uh, a lot of amazing folks come through and share their wisdom about just where we are in the world today, um, where we should be going, what are some of the skills and the principles and the practice that uh, could be beneficial for us in, in, in kind of engaging in this moment in skillful ways. And we're, I, I'm particularly excited to have Leone and particularly excited to have her talk about this topic today. Uh, I, I wanna share a, a brief story. Um, one of my, my best friends is, is a black woman um, who lives in Oakland. And one of the first conversations that we ever had was when we ended up in a car together on the way back from Deer Park Monastery, which is a Buddhist monastery in Southern California. And when we got in the car, like we both knew of each other because we were in a lot of shared communities, but we didn't know a whole lot about each other. And so we started talking and I was sharing with her that I teach this thing called Kingian nonviolence, which many of you may be familiar with, um, the philosophies of Dr. Martin Luther King. And she said this funny thing to me after I told her what Kingian nonviolence was. She said that, oh, I actually never talked to you before because I thought you taught nonviolent communication and that stuff really pisses me off. And, and I think that comment is something that I, or, or sim, comments similar to that is something I've heard over and over and over from friends of mine that are people of color. And as a person of color myself and as someone who practices and teaches nonviolence, I've also had a, a long-standing practice in nonviolent communication. Like I've been hearing about nonviolent communication for so long, good things and bad things, um, but I never actually taken a training in it. So I decided to like immerse myself in it so that I can understand um, the benefits of it as well as some of the criticisms. And I found that um, there's a, 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 a Chicana nonviolence teacher who says that I believe in the principles of nonviolent communication, but not always in the practices. And for myself, as I've deepened in my own practice and understanding of nonviolent communication, I found that there's ways in which it is a universal set of principles and practices and has been extremely helpful in my life, as well in the lives of many, many people that I know, including people of color. And I've also experienced that the ways that nonviolent communication is somehow taught and used has been extremely harmful and damaging. And I think that's the case with a lot of fields of nonviolence, but particularly so nonviolent communication. And so that's why I'm, I'm especially excited to be having this conversation with Leone and learning from her and her wisdom. Um, Leone is someone that I, I haven't known for 20 years, but in the short time that I've known her, I, I've seen her as someone who's very skillful in a way that oftentimes NVC is practiced in a way that is not skillful. Um, the way that she's able to convey the teachings of nonviolent communication, as well as um, things like sociocracy, um, with a, a, a deep understanding of the needs of all people and of the power dynamics that are present in the room and her ability to like move us through these processes in a way that is that creates a really safe container is, is a really particular skill set that I think we need more and more of these days. And so really excited to have you, Leone, on this call and really excited that we've been able to build a closer and closer relationship over the last year or so and, and excited to continue to, to work with you more and to continue to learn from you. Uh, and so with that, I will hand it over to Leone and she'll uh, kind of facilitate us through a uh, conversation and then, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens from there. So thank you for All being right. here, Leone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kazu, for that warm introduction. And I'm really glad to see everybody here today. So as Kazu mentioned, this really is meant to be more of as much of a conversation as possible. Feel free to um, uh, jump in with questions. And also, if I'm not clear, speaking too fast, speaking too slow, I'll see what I can do about it. But I'm really excited to be here to talk about this topic that um, around which is on NVC for the rest of us. And uh, throughout our time today, what I'll be um, sharing with you is kind of 
um, there's a lot about my own personal journey with NVC because my personal journey has been the thing that has anchored and supported my vocation. I'm primarily, um, where I find meaning in my life is around um, exploring um, principles of nonviolence and NVC sociocracy, ways of working and being together, uh, whether it's in community, in um, activist movements, in organizations that generate and create less harm. And I have a particular interest in um, doing so. I have a point of view or perspective that's really about um, focusing how to reduce harm for people who come from marginalized backgrounds. And I um, consider myself such a person. And that is essentially the focus of what is my vocation. It's what, it's how I live and it's the work that I do. Um, so let's talk about what is NVC. Um, so I'm just going to share with you briefly um, a somewhat definition of NVC. Um, the NVC really is about uh, tapping into our deeper understanding of what our needs are. Um, there's an invitation to do deep listening, both for ourselves and for others. It's about exploring a connection through empathy and compassion. It can also be a spiritual practice, which is around taking on the larger lens of nonviolence or taking on what's called NVC consciousness. Um, and it can often be transformative, at least that is the promise of it. So um, hearing that, that often sounds good. People are really attracted to NVC. It's something that is, um, that has a lot of support. So how do I get to this idea of NVC for the rest of us? Well, I'll say this. Um, so, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask for support probably uh, from you, Astrid um, or Kazu, uh, because I don't really um, notice things in the chat or raised hands. If you could let me know if that's happening, then that'd be great. Um, so uh, NVC for the rest of us. Like, so early in my time learning about NVC, I came to NVC because I was having some difficulty in work and I was actually just looking for a communication model. And so I had um, found NVC just kind of by accident, and I read the book, um, which is Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, and early in my time as a learner of NVC, I had what I've since learned is a fairly common experience for people of color and other people who um, have been marginalized um, in the NVC community. That it's, it's, and this is an experience that's not only in NVC community, it's something that I've encountered that many people have encountered and is true in many communities that are in some way about making the world better. It's also true for many movements like environmental movement, human rights movements, uh, feminist movements. Um, but I was moved learning about NVC um, and I had been so divorced from the idea of having feelings and needs that much of what I was learning felt like a discovery. It felt kind of brand new to me. And so I was really open. I was deeply committed to my learning and I was vulnerable in ways that I had never been in my, um, in the church community that I grew up in, um, in my friend group or even in my family. And so I would have these experiences being in NVC gatherings, whether they were in person or online. And I would have these experiences of gaps. You know, um, in NVC, they talk about universal needs. And there were lots of things that were kind of universalized, um, at least in my experience and learning and being in these spaces. Uh, but they actually weren't speaking to what my experience was. Um, so I was struggling and I was also struggling in speaking to that experience as many people do when communicating um, with those who have access to privilege in systems that they often are not aware of that they're acting in systems. Um, and so um, I was having these struggles within NVC community and my engagement and encounter with people who were kind of traditionalists um, with NVC, particularly those who use NVC has, um, traditional NVC has kind of like, um, um, has developed this kind of like formatted way of almost like speaking and community, uh, communicating. Um, it's uh, colloquially referred to as OFNR, observations, feelings, needs, and requests. And so 
for those of you who have some familiarity with MVC, you may heard have heard people say, you know, when you do this, I feel this and it doesn't meet my need for this, are you willing to do this? So those are the observations, feelings, needs, and requests. And so my experience was that these high level concepts made sense, but the expected behaviors and the perspectives and ways of being pulled me out of myself. Um, I was being stretched to like the point of breaking, like it was a really disruptive experience that I was having fairly early in my time, probably within the first year, 18 months of learning. MVC. Um, and this was, this experience was happening at a time when I was also fairly new, but also fairly active in my own understanding of how colonization and oppression was impacting my understanding of myself. I was really active in my own decolonization work. And so that tension actually, um, it felt like too much, like it was actually making me sick. It was making me feel um, um, alienated. Um, from NVC community. And so I had a time when there was kind of a very painful separation uh, between myself and NVC community. And um, I started to, in that time, become more interested in the larger, uh, in nonviolence itself and not so much NVC. It felt like stepping into that gave me, gave me more space to breathe. Um, it's where I was kind of learning about things like nonviolent consciousness and then through that, I, I kind of found my way back to NVC community. Um, and there was more of a sense of resonance. <clears throat> so the resonance part was really important to me because um, nonviolence has deep roots in communities of, of, of color um, and deep roots in communities of people who have been marginalized. And so acknowledging this turned out to be really important to me um, I really began to resonate with principles of nonviolence and that sense of resonating with principles of nonviolence didn't just come from admiration of the experiences or stories of Gandhi and King um, and others who we think of when we think about nonviolence. There was something about stepping into understanding the larger picture of nonviolence, such as I understood it at that time, that felt like a coming home. There was like something familiar about it in my bones. Um, it felt like something that I had encountered before. And so um, knowing that and feeling that helped me to kind of settle and help me to build in even further in my commitment in exploring, um, in exploring nonviolence and in exploring NVC in a way that would work better for me um, in a way that, um, and being able to engage in NVC community in a way that I could be seen. And yet I was having all these discoveries and I was still in my life. I was confronting, confronted daily by racism and oppression and I was connecting with communities that were also dealing with the same, including within NVC community itself. And so, um, and that is, so for those of you who have some familiar, familiarity with NVC community, you may know that Within NVC community, the formal NVC community, there's active conflict around, the, around conversations around power, privilege, oppression, and racism. And so um, the conflict is about whether or not these things speak to needs. Um, as you can imagine, that's a very alienating experience. And so um, while being in NVC community and experiencing um, like on a visceral level, this conflict around this conversation, I really had a desire to, for just to have actually some sense of like tenderness and being seen. And so I moved into this question of like, how is it that we can, um, how is it that I could take care of myself while being in this community and being confronted by racism and acts of oppression? And so, um, um, the invitation is this in my mind. Um, it's really to step into holding and recognizing the humanity, the humanity of all people, um, including those who we are opposed to, those who have couched themselves as being in opposition to us, and those who are actors in systems of oppressions that set them in opposition to who it is that we are. Um, 
for me, it was about moving to this place, this understanding and growing in my understanding about holding how systems work, holding what my role is in the system, understanding the role of others in the system, and stepping towards um, holding compassion for the impact on the system, not just on myself as the object of other people's racism and oppression, but also on the actors who are actively engaged in um, or that have, you know, targeted me and other people like me. So it wasn't just about having empathy. It was also about having knowledge of systems of oppression and having a deepening and growing awareness of how systems of oppression live in me and in us and how we're impacted um, by them and by our positionality. And I know that I've been like speaking for a, a while, so I just want to check to see if there's like any kind of clarifying questions or any even like reactions to what it is that I'm sharing so far. Uh, please feel free to um, just unmute yourself or to put something in the chat. Thank you. I, uh, Shanae, yes, thank you for saying that it's helpful to hear. Much appreciate that reaction. It looks like there's a question from Kathleen McGee. Um, Hi, thank you. I'm uh, moved by your story and your, your sharing of that very personal experience and the pain that you had. And I heard, I was curious about like discerning between like the idea of being targeted and then the idea of just like blind not um people being blind to their mm -hmm. cultural their cultural conditioning and how their their systemic racism or internal racism is is playing out um unconsciously versus uh mm -hmm. them targeting a person of color i'm curious mm -hmm. about those differences yeah so the you know the impact of those behaviors can often feel and and, and is the same and yet there is something about being in the active engagement of my own decolonization, that I was able to see my role in the system. I was growing clearer in understanding my role in systems of oppression um, and also the role of others and including that others are, you know, how systems, one of the kind of foundational tenets of systems of oppression is that the people who are doing the oppressing often have little to no awareness um, that what they're doing is oppressive. And so there's, something about moving into that space of what I was talking about earlier of kind of understanding that we're all in the same soup. Um, that um, because I was in that place of discovering my own self. I was in that place of, of decolonizing my own thinking, um, looking at how internal, how I, how, how I had internalized oppression. And so um, what it has helped me to do is to move to a place of having um, more compassion, including those people who are taking actions that are um, harmful um, towards me. Um, but it also it also helped me to get clear about what the where the harm was, because what had happened, what often happens if you are a person who comes from a marginalized community, is that you become very used to the idea of oppression. Um, you become used to the kind of abuses that happen on the daily, on a daily basis. You become used to kind of racism and you kind of like, there's like gradients of it and you have like different reactions for things that are more acute or not. But the truth is that at least for me, and I think it's true for many other people, is that the impact of those things are acute Regardless, there's, there, there really isn't a sense of there being like radiation. It's not like how it is on a felt sense and like as, as a lived experience. And so as I became clearer about people's, about systems of oppression and how they act out, I also became clearer about what I would and would, would not accept and when I would intervene. Um, in both nonviolence and NVC, that's often couched under the label of, of the language just left me. What's it called? Protective use of force. <laughs> That's it. Um, so I became also very clear about um, what I can do, and NVC helped me with this, what I could do to respond to acts of harm as they were happening. And I also became clear, which I'll also talk about a little later, about what I can do to process incidents so I could understand fully 
where the harm in the learning was in order to support me in being more anchored in my principles. Thank you for the question, Kathleen. Thank you, thank you. Mm. And Leone, if you're open to it, there's another hand from another Kathleen. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, first of all, Leone, I just want to, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quite well. I just want to say I am so moved by the story of your journey and your process to keep going deeper and finding more truth for yourself. I just want to say it personally was healing to hear mm. for me. I also wanted to ask about a comment that you made. You said that um, in the NBC circles, there was conflict about whether conversations about racism speak to needs. I find mm -hmm. that quite puzzling and I was wondering if you could expand what is the dilemma that people are seeing? Or what is that conversation? I'm, I'm not even familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conversation has mostly been focused on the idea of power and privilege and whether or not they are needs. And so there is a, a, an active um, conversation that has been happening for several years as more and more people have um, come into NVC community that have an interest in social justice and are bringing in language around social justice, around whether or not they are seen as legitimate needs or not. Um, I can't, I, 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 <clears throat> I'm realizing that I'm saying these words and they're not clear to me because I, I, I don't, I, I honestly don't get it. Um, my only way of understanding it is that these are conversations that are typical of uh, people who come from the dominant system um, kind of uh, not um, being able to move to a place of understanding kind of some of the harm that can be done by the positions that they take. I can't honestly say that I have an understanding of what it is. It's been one of my main frustrations because regardless of whether or not you want to hold power and privilege as being a need or not, there are people who are coming to our community, um, and some of this has been very public. There's been articles written and responses done. And there are people who are coming to, our, to, uh, to the community of NVC, and what they are saying is that they are finding that these spaces are not warm to them, that they are experiencing racism and acts of oppression, that they're not finding space to have conversations about things that are impactful to them on the daily. And the response of some people within NVC circles is to actually not address the impact of what it is that they're doing, but to speak more and try to affirm what their intention is, which leads to further alienation and disconnection. So I'm not exactly, I, I am very confused, um, I will say honestly, by that conversation because it seems to be completely outside of like basic skill sets around NVC and nonviolence. My only way of understanding it is by, um, it comes from my understanding of the role of kind of like dominant cultures and white supremacy and how it often um, um, separates or uh, uh, um, um, kind of puts um, a scrim on, on understanding the, the experiences of people who don't come from the dominant culture. So I don't know if, that, if that's clear, but that's honestly where I'm at with that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Leone, I, there's a couple more hands. I'm not sure how you want to proceed, but I also just wanted to lift up a couple of comments in the chat as well, mm -hmm. um, particularly mm -hmm. from uh, Indigo and Sanjar, who are both women of color, who, who I think have very uh, shared experiences um, with you in terms of their, their kind of path through nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. um, so wanted to see if either mm -hmm. one of them wanted to speak as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, your voices are welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hi, Leone. This is Sandra. Um, I, I would just share that it really resonated with me what you um, shared. And, and in all frankness, I, I'm similar to Kazu's friend in the car that I've avoided those spaces uh, because it just feels very policing. Um, mm. And not uh, 
sensitive to the ways in which, at least in my community, how that I, are ways of expression. Mm. Um, uh, and particularly when you're not modeling, as you mentioned, traditional OFNR. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a question, but I did, I did want to share that, that what you're saying really does resonate for me. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sandra. Yeah, um, it, it's, an, um, it's an experience that I hear often from people who come from marginalized backgrounds um, about NVC community and their experience of it. Um, and what I can say is, is that there are ways of being able to find and to settle yourself in communities in which you can be seen and in which your more natural expression um, um, is encouraged. And we'll talk a little bit, more, a bit more about that as we move through our time together today. Thank you. Mm. I'm not and seeing- Leone, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know if you wanted to keep moving through your presentation, but just um, uh, noting that Sabrina had her hand up briefly and then her mm -hmm. hand went down and put a question in the chat. Uh, so yeah. Sabrina, I don't know if you wanted to come off of mute and speak your question into the group. Uh, that would be great, Sabrina, if you could. Thank you. I was a few minutes late. Uh, I, I was curious how you, um, you, you know, you said we're all in the same soup and a lot of your work of decolonizing and, and finding the truth for yourself. And uh, if it hasn't been covered already, I was curious if you could maybe mm. relate some resources or how you, what, what that story is. Yeah. So, um, I've been active in the space of kind of anti-racist, anti-oppressive work since I was a teenager. And so I had a lot of the language that's become fairly common around anti-racism and oppression, around power, privilege, microaggressions, that kind of stuff. Very familiar with it for a very long time. And yet that wasn't um, all that supportive of me around my own decolonization. My way of actually entering decolonization was that, um, was actually, I started through fiction. Um, I started to read more and more about uh, the experiences of Black people. So I was reading a lot of, I'm Canadian born and raised, but I really identify as being West Indian or Jamaican because I was raised in a matriarchal family by Jamaican women. And I'm the only one of my siblings who was born and raised in Canada. So I started reading what was available, which is a lot of African-American history. Um, and, and I recognize really through a felt sense that like, there were things that were familiar there, but that they didn't necessarily speak to the um, history that I come from as a person who comes from, for example, British colonial background as opposed to American colonial background. So then I started um, finding authors of West Indian, particularly Jamaican heritage and reading some of their fiction, reading some of their understanding, um, their fiction, particularly around um, enslavement. Um, and that, it resonated with me because it helped me to understand, like particularly the island where my family is from. So, um, so it was, and that, and reading their fiction and then reading where they got their, their, their source material. So I started reading, for example, histories of black people that were written by black people. So I started reading black historians. I started reading, for example, um, because I said I'm, I uh, come from a background of British colonization, one of the books that I read that was really influential was Black and British by David um, Olusoga. He's a Black historian of Nigerian and British descent. Um, and so he spoke to the kind of history that where my particular family comes from. I also started reading, um, I also read um, a micro history that compared uh, two plantations, one in Virginia and one in Jamaica called A Tale of Two Plantations by Richard Dunn. And so it was good to be able to see the differences that were there because um, um, there's a lot in common with Black people around the world, but there is significant differences in the experiences of enslavement for people who come from British colonial as opposed to American colonial backgrounds. And it was really important for me because one of the um, early, one of the early things in my own story around decolonization was actually to step into a place of mourning because what I realized is that um, everything about me is, 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 is about colonization. My first name is because of colonization. My last name is because of colonization. The island where my family come is native to people of, of, of uh, indigenous or Native American. It's not indigenous people of African descent. So it's just this sense of like, 
my history ends at the water's edge. Um, there's no history of who I am outside of the story of enslavement of African peoples. Um, and so it was really important for me to kind of really engage with that idea, to step into a place of mourning, and then ultimately get to a place of like um, reconciling with that in some way, and actually being able to step further into my ancestry to places of being able to celebrate things about my history. Like, what does it mean to be a person of African descent, even if I can't name where it is that I'm from, that kind of thing. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. I have British background as well. I'm from India, so I'm mm -hmm. looking to decolonize also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my story. Thank you for the question, Sabrina. Hmm. So I'm not seeing anything else. So I think I'm just going to um, just, con just continue to share some more and I'll, I'll check in with you again, with you all again. So I think I was in a place where I was talking about how I um, was moving to this place of understanding colonization um, and understanding and, and how it kind of shaped my engagement with systems of oppression. And so um, there were other things, and uh, there was um, some incidents that particularly shaped um, my particular vocation, which I spoke to earlier. Um, and so I want to share one of those stories uh, that really has helped to shape me. Shape, shape me. Um, so I was at a retreat. It was an NVC retreat, and um, what? At this NVC retreat, so you can imagine there's, um, it was focused on social justice. So there was a, a person of color who was kind of teaching at the front of the room. And there was a white woman who was in the room. The room was probably mostly people of color. And there was a young Latina woman who was also in the space. And the person at the front would say something or ask a question. And so the white woman kind of like pop up, would, would like pop up her hand and like answer the question. And this had happened several times. And then um, there was, um, this triggered the Latina woman. And so she kind of like, just became really angry and, you know, had said that like, she basically was feeling like crowded out of the space because of the constant popping up of the hand. And so um, as typical in NVC retreats, we kind of have these things called empathy groups. And so I happened to be in an empathy group with the young Latina woman, it was myself. so middle-aged black woman, um, born in Canada, West Indian background. There was an African-American woman, a generation or so older than me, like in her 60s. There was this young Latina woman in her 20s, and then there was a young white woman. And the thing that we had discovered in talking about this incident was that for all of us who are people of color, the three of the, of the four of us, we'd all had the experience in the school system of raising our hand in class seeing a white person raise their hand and lowering our hand. So we had all done it, even though we came from very different backgrounds. And so that really speaks to what, what it taught me in that moment was, this is the impact of white supremacy. This is why it was that we, we had a common experience, despite the fact that we're different generations, different backgrounds, raised in different countries. And so with that incident, um, and with my NVC, my growing NVC skills and my curiosity and engagement around um, decolonization, I started to understand some of my own behavior. So prior to this, people would have described me as shy. And when I was in, this might not be, be believable now, but like when I was in all up in my um, school years, and my, my report cards, they all talked about Leonie doesn't talk. Leonie's shy. She doesn't say anything in class. And so I started to understand that I wasn't shy. I really started to take a look at this from a systems perspective. And I moved away from this label of shy to rec recognizing what my role was as an actor in systems of oppression. So I'm a person, I'm in a black body, I'm female identified, I'm in a big body, right? I'm a stutterer, I speak quietly. This was true for me then. And so these are all kind of facts. But I also had to acknowledge some of the things that I had taken on as truth 
that came from my understanding and internalization of systems of oppression. And this had informed my entire life. Some of those things are, they're even hard to even speak of now, but that I had an understanding of myself as being less intelligent. Not only that I wasn't smart, but I had less capacity to be smart. That came from my experience within the school system. An understanding of myself that I was meant to be small, that I was meant to defer to white people and to whiteness. This all came from this incident that happened at this retreat. I was taking, I'd taken on as truth that white people and whiteness are the standard, that they're the best. And I took on that I had nothing really to contribute. I also took on that I could not, I didn't have the freedom to make mistakes. And so by unpacking this incident, both in that empathy group, but also through um, journaling and conversations following that incident and using tools of NVC, I started to, to try and unpack these stories, these kind of ghosts that have always been with me, these feelings. Um, and so the invitation, so, so then I, start, I did, um, I took kind of conventional tools of NVC. In NVC, there are um, needs and feelings inventories, which are common lists that are done. In fact, I'll put um, a link uh, in if you want to see kind of what one looks like and to access it. Just do that quickly here. And I have, that's gonna be the needs inventory and I'm gonna share the feelings inventory. So these are common lists that are used in traditional NVC. And so my use of this list, of these lists included, um, I wanted to have an understanding of kind of like what the feelings were. I wanted to tap into what my feelings were around this habit that I had of not, or this way that I was habituated rather, to like not speak up and to not participate and to defer to whiteness. So I started to make some guesses around what my feelings might be around it. And then I went to a place of, if I wasn't feeling this way, then what would be true? And that pointed to needs. It can sometimes, excuse me. And sometimes point to like what the opposite feelings are, but needs uh, for me personally, they land more. And so I tend to kind of use feelings as a way to understand and interpret needs. And then I started to look at the question of when gathered with, with other people where I'm in the minority, which is true of most spaces that I'm in, whether I'm at work or um, in NVC spaces, um, what are these needs? These are my needs in order for me to feel that my contribution is welcomed. And so I arrived at that. Um, and so what I'd like to do is actually to share with you kind of what that process looked like for me. Um, and um, just give me one moment here. So again, we're looking at this question of, um, I've come out of this, this NVC retreat I've had this experience um, of that I've witnessed and then also started to kind of unpack in the empathy groups. Uh, so I'm wrestling with not only what had happened, but also wanting to acknowledge my own role or trying to understand my own reasons for um, not um, being a person who would share or contribute in the larger group. And so I'm using now these NVC tools to try and guess at the things that I'm feeling. And so what I came up with was kind of like a set of feelings that were, um, you know, that I was feeling apprehensive and worried and angry, um, some sense of like um, contempt. So this is the, the kind of feelings that come up for me um, when I am in a place of wanting to make a contribution and don't feel like I can make a contribution in mixed groups and some sense of being frustrated and resentful, resentful because I wanna share something and I don't have a way or means of sharing it. But there were also like feelings of like self-hate as well. Um, again, that would go back to my feeling of not feeling like I'm intelligent or have the capacity of being intelligent, which also could generate some sense of shame or feeling like insecure. So those are kind of like some of the feelings that I came up with around what's happening for me in those moments. And then the next question that I take a look at, so this is um, 
this is kind of like a self empathy slash decolonization process that I guess I generated um, in support of myself around this question was that if I wasn't feeling this way, if I didn't have those feelings, what would be true? Um, and so that led to some needs that were coming up for me. Um, I would want to be, I would want to have a sense of flow. I'd want to know that I was contributing. I'm wondering if, if any of you have any guesses about what it is that I would be wanting in those moments. And you don't have to use the needs from the, the, the feelings and needs list, just any guesses at all um, of what I've been wanting for myself in those moments. Belonging. Belonging, definitely strong one. Yes, thank you. Want to be seen, some sense of an invitation. Yep, invitation, some warmth to be heard, to feel valued. All of those, yep, all of those things are very accurate. Some sense of engagement. Also some sense of like authenticity, right? Because oftentimes when we are a person who comes from marginalized backgrounds and we're in these larger kind of mixed groups, um, there are things that are said that are kind of accept, accepted as normative and they may be outside of our experiences. But in my case, I didn't feel that I had what it took to contribute to that conversation, to add in kind of that gap. So there's also that sense of like, wanting some authenticity. Um, and, and I love the, uh, the, the naming of kind of warmth. I'm just gonna take a look and see what Indigo's comment is here. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm hearing, I'm seeing from your comment and to go that this, that there's a lot of resonance here about what it is that I've shared um, well, with your own self. And this is something that I, I, I've heard from many other people um, who come from marginalized backgrounds, particularly people of color, is that um, the process of kind of stepping into this place of decolonization is really about stepping into, stepping into your own self. It's about kind of removing the scrim of all the expectations, um, all of the kind of set of behaviors that we end up taking on um, as we navigate and negotiate the world when we're not from the dominant culture, not from the dominant system. And so it really is a place of deep discovery oftentimes um, when we start to step into this, these, um, these activities that are about supporting ourselves in, um, in decolonizing our way of thinking and really stepping into our own self and understanding ourselves absent of the kind of um, judgments that come from us in the dominant culture. I just want to check to see too if anyone had any like um, comments or questions or um, want to share anything about resonance. Um, just to feel free to unmute yourself or, 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 or to check to see if I've missed any comments that or questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Raya, you said this is like how to use NVC on myself before I even join an NVC session. That is exactly what this is. Um, because it's really important for us to be able to show up in these spaces um, in a way that allows us to maximize our experience of our full humanity. And the thing is, is that Though NVC spaces are places of great warmth, of encouragement, of community, they do come from and are steeped in dominant cultures. And so therefore, um, it's unfortunate, but it's true that more is required of us, particularly if we come from marginalized backgrounds, if we want to be able to step into those places and to be able to experience a sense of community. And so doing some of this kind of like um, um, examining work for ourselves, allows us to be clear about what our contributions will be once we're in those spaces. And, to, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to create some space for ourselves, how we can shape those spaces um, so that we can, it could also support our sense of, of, of widening the window of welcome when we're there. Stephanie, I see you have your hand raised, please. Yeah, um, I really um, have so appreciate this all along. Um, my experience with NBC was um, when I took I took workshops 
and mm -hmm. would come home and my friends and I took workshops. We were young mothers at the time. We had three year olds and they would, they would just like, don't talk to me like that. They would, they would literally, it felt so violent the way we were talking to them. And so mm -hmm. coming into this, I'm just recognizing the oppression, you know, as the oppressor where I didn't recognize my power differential. And so I'm kind of thinking about the responsibility of um, understanding the system, like understanding the dynamic of race mm -hmm. in the setting where it shouldn't be just the work. Like it almost feels like to me, this work helps me get in touch with myself, but then there's a responsibility to think about power differential so that often I feel like NBC is just used get, to get you to listen to me, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm using the right script. You should be hearing my feelings instead yeah. of, I want to use my script to understand your feelings. Is, is that yeah. what you said? Yeah. Um, and then you see, I was experienced with many people as that. That's what you described within the latter. And, um, and the thing that I want to hold is that, like, the people who use NVC in that way, the people who you engage with around NVC and have some sense of disconnection and alienation are often doing the best that they can. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the best that they can can also end up creating harm and being disconnecting. And so this is where I say that those of us who hold more of the consciousness, who have some awareness and interest and curiosity about the use of power and privilege, we, we end up having to bring more to the conversation um, because there is, this is also part of the dominant culture in that there is a sense of like scarcity. And so um, needs can sometimes be expressed, even those who have a lot of experience in NVC, I call them like needs bullets. It's kind of like they name all the things that they want you to do in order for them to feel comfortable. And there isn't enough, it's not balanced enough with a sense of curiosity about what that means for you. And so therefore you um, part of the responsibility that we hold is to expand the space when we're in dialogue with people to hold more care for more of the needs. So how can we gently be able to approach and to be able to state um, that we're not, we're not having a, 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 an experience of spaciousness, that we're really clear about what their needs are and that we really would appreciate some sense of curiosity. Is there space that, you know, can we, um, would you be willing to hear me as I um, process what the impact is of what your request is, those kinds of things that you have to, um, that the invitation is there to start to learn how to interrupt those kinds of conversations and dialogues to make room for there to be more partnership. Um, and that's, it's not easy to do because we do, we're, for those of us who come from, who have been steeped in dominant culture, regardless of what our position is within that culture, you know, competition, you know, the sense of winning, right and wrong thinking, these are all things that like, we all have to struggle with. But it is possible, it is doable, and there are things in NVC that can help us to learn how to, to navigate, negotiate, um, and step towards partnership in that way. Thank you, Stephanie. I see there's uh, something from Liam and Jess. Hello. Um, hey. Uh, so I had a question, and I think that, so a lot of this is, so I, I'm new to NVC. I've done mm -hmm. a lot of, I've done nonviolent trainings with, um, with, with Kazu actually. And, uh, and I've done a lot of work in that space, but I've never actually trained in the specifics of nonviolent communication. So a lot of this is like going a little bit over my head. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a request and a question. Mm -hmm. uh, my request is, could, uh, is it possible to talk a little bit more about like the basics of nonviolent communication so that if there's folks on the call that aren't super familiar with or like entrenched in this uh, paradigm, the, it makes a little bit more sense. And um, the other thing is, it, if it's my understanding and I don't know very much about, I haven't participated in trainings in nonviolent communication, so I don't know, but um, someone just said about like using nonviolent communication techniques on yourself before using it on other people. I'm not using great words, but um, my question is like, I get the sense that like, isn't that really the purpose of nonviolent communication overall? 
that like we use it to both take a look at like our communication and also so it's not just about is it or am i wrong is it just about getting your needs across i thought it was about better understanding the needs of of others like mm-hmm. i thought that's what it was all about like that was the whole point yeah is that yeah. true or no or i don't know i'm in, i'm new okay yeah so i'll start with the latter um for where from where i sit that is a point of nonviolent communication and i would say that that's a a core principle in teaching around nonviolent communication i think what we're speaking to here is the um, difference between kind of what is held as a, as core kind of teachings and then what the experience is often of some people. Um, so the experience that people um, often have is that um, there isn't enough of a sense of uh, partnership and dialogue that um, NVC can be used in such a way that um, a person is essentially trying to get more of their needs met uh, without due consideration of the needs of other people. I mean, it can be done because it essentially, um, and, and this is about for, this is true in many ways because some people do see NVC as, a, as I saw it when I first started learning it, as a communication model. And so if you are to follow kind of very traditional ways or to see NVC hold it as a communication model, you can end up engaging in um, um, naming your observations, naming what your feelings are, naming what your needs are, and naming requests, and not having enough, enough of a sense of curiosity about what's hope, happening for the other people. So it's um, more about how it's um, experienced and how people kind of use the tools that um, um, often cause, um, is, explains the divide between what NVC is in principle and how it's actually lived and experienced by people. Is, how's that for a response to that last question, Liam? That um, was phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, and what's interesting is, as someone who is newly discovering NVC mm-hmm. as a model, not as a concept, mm-hmm. it's surprising to me that what you're speaking of would not actually be inherently built into the, the model mm-hmm. of communication as a communication tool. It seems, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're new to NVC and you may have a different experience, but I think it's good to have this conversation so that you have a sense of kind of what also may show up. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a different kind of experience that again, as you grow in your commitment to nonviolence and your understanding of NVC, you can find a way of working with it in such a way to bring more of a sense of balance. Um, um, and I'll try to infuse more of kind of like some basics of, of NVC, um, but we'll, we'll, I, can, I, I can commit to trying. That's what I can do in this moment. Thank you. I think that there are a couple of questions that were in the chat. Um, um, I think there was one from, I'm just trying to find. Is it, Uh, Sabrina, um, I think your question, your statement or question had to do with um, though the bureaucratic nature of certification at NVC is intersects with your unpacking and learning and also one from Rati. Um, I like to understand how NVC can help us in spaces where I'm uh, one in which I'm marginalized and another in which I hold privilege. Um, certification. Oh, okay. All right, well, you asked it, so here it comes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the certification process in NVC is, uh, from where I said, deeply, pro- deeply, deeply problematic. Um, I myself am a certification candidate for a very specific reason. Um, and I'm also a certification can- candidate because I'm in a BIPOC group that is working towards certification. And it, it is the only way that I would ever consider certification around NVC. Um, many ways, uh, because of how I'm choosing to do my certification, I'm protected by a lot of the bureaucratic elements of the certification process. So the invitation that I, and, and you're, in, you're definitely in a dilemma if you want to work towards certification around NVC, um, particularly if you come from a marginalized background or if you're interested in nonviolence or NVC and social justice, 
um, there isn't room for those structures um, within the certification process, unless you find yourself in a group that's interested in stepping into that exploration. So unfortunately, there is a gap that's real and that's there. And the only way that I know of to address it is to really shop around for a certification process, potentially a, commu a community process um, in which you can find space for yourself and what it is that you want to explore as part of your certification. And that will also help to put distance between you and the bureaucratic elements of the certification process. I hope that's helpful. Um, the other piece, um, uh, Rati, if, that's, if, that's, if I'm pronouncing your name right, please let me know if I'm not. Um, understanding how NVC can help in spaces where one is marginalized and in other words, I hold privileged. Were you want to speak more to what that experience is? So, yeah. Hi, I'm an audible. Can you up your volume a little bit? It's a bit of a struggle to yeah. hear you. Yes. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, this is good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, my question is, so I come from India. Mm -hmm. And um, I identify as a female. Um, you know, in, in, so we have a lot of dynamics in terms of caste, religion, um, class, for instance, in this country. So what I wanted to understand was, um, I mean, uh, you know, the religion that I'm born into is a religion that is considered to be a majority in the country, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but as a woman, um, you know, as someone from the lower middle class, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a completely different dynamic. So, mm -hmm. um, so I often find myself, uh, you know, moving between these spaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand that I'm marginalized in many ways, but I also hold certain privilege. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so how do I, uh, you know, navigate the, this dynamic that exists? And um, does NBC address someone who experiences both these spaces, you know, marginalized yeah. as well as a place of privilege? Yeah. Thank you. So much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say that there are things in NBC that can help to address both. If you, if you find yourself, um, there's an NBC trainer named Gianti uh, Siva. She's... Um, excellent and she talks about kind of like one up one down um so it's kind of navigating that type of relationship of um and so one of the things that i would say that when we find ourselves in position of privilege is one of the uh, tools that i find really useful is around um how to engage in dialogue with a sense of curiosity so moving from a place of of, of any of the assumptions assumptions that we hold um, and really asking people to speak to us about what their experience is, asking them what, what their needs are, asking them for what their request is, like really just being curious um, so that um, the dialogue and the conversation that you're engaged in, you're really learning about what's important to that person and hearing it in their own words. So that would be like a, 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 my way of addressing kind of when we're in a place of privilege. When we're in a place where we're not being privileged, it really is about what I call creating the container. Um, that's at least one of the tools that I use. So if I, so I use this, for example, when I'm in spaces where there is a lot, where I'm in the minority. Um, um, so for example, when I go back to this incident and the work that I did around understanding um, that it's not shyness, that it's actually an Im uh, impacts of oppression that had led to, um, habituated behaviors that look like shyness. And I made, the, I made a commitment to wanting to speak more in mixed groups. So one of the ways that I was able to do that, to take it from exploring feelings and needs into, into action, was that I came up with a strategy that I would do what I call creating the container. And what that means, what it looks like, for example, is that um, I... So when you're in a position where you are not a person experiencing privilege, you are often in a situation in which the norms and rules of, of whatever culture and that doesn't actually work for you. It's not built for around your inclusion. Um, so creating the container, container has to do with the request making part of NVC. So 
For example, if I wanted to speak into a space, but I'm not habituated to speaking into that space, one of the things that I would say, for example, would be something along the lines of, there's a piece here that I'm not hearing and I want to like speak to it. And I may struggle to find the words and I'm just asking for your patience. And I'll check in with you in, in case I'm not clear once I'm done with my expression. And then I would say whatever it is I had to say. So by doing that, I was making a clear request of what it is that I needed in order for me to express myself. And as I had more and more practice, I don't need those kinds of like training wheels anymore. I'm able to um, hold space while making my own request and making my own expressions. Is that helpful at all? Okay, I'm seeing your head nodding. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, I know there's lots more happening in the chat and I don't know if there are questions there. I'm just gonna take a quick look and also would call on the help of Kazu and others <laughs> if I'm missing anything. Yeah, I think there's a, a really interesting and critical conversation happening in the chat right now, just in terms of the, the, the context of this particular workshop and, mm. and um, wanting to hear, make sure we're, we're centering the voices of uh, BIPOC and marginalized people on this call specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and requests are being made for what identifying folks to perhaps make a little bit more space for other people to show up. And just as, as, as East Point, I want to apologize also because when we do more of an official Q&A. We have a practice of hearing from BIPOC uh, people first, but because this has been kind of a, a, a conversation throughout, we haven't been as good at, at holding that. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if you have thoughts that you want to share on that, Leonie, as well. Yeah, I really welcome the invitation um, and recognize the need. Um, and I also recognize my own role in that um, I'm, I, 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 I don't necessarily keep Q&A to a, a fixed area and have, I, I have invited expressly people's questions um, and the conversation. So the thing that I would maybe um, invite us to consider as a request in order to meet this request and to meet these needs that have been named um, is that um, when an opportunity is created for um, those of us who, those of you in the audience to speak and to ask questions, if we can just pause to see first if there are any uh, people who are um, who identify as black indigenous people of color um, to see if they have any questions. Um, and that's a way that we can um, co-hold that request. Um, so thank you for those of you who have mentioned it and I'm hoping that that will help us in our time that's remaining. <clears throat> okay. So um, I wanted to speak a little bit to about um, one of the, one of the um, ways that, one of the things that I really care for and, and um, love about NVC, and it's one of the areas uh, that I directly um, do work in, and that is how NVC can support responding to racism and other forms of oppression. Um, so for me, um, really holding an understanding of nonviolence consciousness is really what contributes mostly to um, that question of responding to racism and oppression. Most of us have an understanding of nonviolence that is actually steeped into that kind of work that um, um, the examples that we often name around nonviolence are around responding to racism and oppression. And from my perspective, I think that NVC can also play an important role in that. Um, as I said, I'm, I, you know, I'm a black woman. I'm, I, I, you know, I, you know, I live in a black body and a female body. I live in a big body. And so when I leave my house, people feel entitled to comment on it pretty much daily. And that's been true my whole life. And so all of this behavior um, can definitely be labeled as oppressive. And you can argue that all of it is also racist. And there are also sometimes very overt acts of racism, you know, um, um, you know, what does it mean? Like how, like, you know, how can you respond if someone, you know, as a person in the black body calls you the N word, for example, well, um, I'll tell you how I used to respond. I used to tell people to fuck off. And it felt good. It felt real good. And there's real brain science that actually supports that. Um, there's a real sense of like righteousness and resonant language that releases like all the good chemicals in your brain. Um, and I also could do it because in part because of my positionality. That's just also important here. I am, as I said, I'm born and raised. I live in Canada. I... Um, I don't live with the same kind of acute violence, for example, as people in black bodies do in other parts of the world, including in the United States. Um, 
even though I come from um, a white supremacist racist country, I just don't live with the same acts of violence, a sense of um, of being at the end of violence because of things that the state are doing. Um, but most, most of what I do in terms of how I respond to racism and oppression comes from having an understanding of systems. So it comes from my own, as I said, reading and studying about systems, understanding myself mostly from my own background, but also being really intentional about understanding how systems of oppression live in me and other people. And so we're in, living in a time now in which there's lots of language that's being thrown out there about oppression and racism. Like, you know, everyone's, it feels like everyone has read like, a, what's that book called? Ugh. White Fragility and all those other books that have become really popular, for example. And then there is also kind of visceral and embodied experiences of oppression that don't actually have the words um, that resonate, that are often, uh, that can be shared quite easily. And so what I find is really helpful about NVC is that it helps, it, it, it's helped me to find my words. Um, because NVC, in terms of acquiring um, and building in the consciousness and in the skills, requires deliberate, deliberate practices. So there are practices such as what I used around unpacking that incident in that retreat, such as journaling, um, building networks of support, um, having practice groups, and creating and being part of practice groups that really welcome and center conversations that are about decolonization, that are about identity, that are about oppression, but also that conversations that explore the gifts and richness of one's own history, um, where you came from, whether it's, it's where you came from or what you have affinity with, um, or wisdom that's like ancient and old and that's in your bones. So for me, NVC has been a way to kind of um, learn to support me in responding to racism and oppression. I'm in a place where I am now where I almost see things in terms of systems first. Um, so if somebody, when people say things or do things that are racist or oppressive, I almost have a, a, an instant understanding of kind of like where it is that they're coming from. And so I may, or, I may choose or choose not to respond. But in all cases, what I do have the ability to do because of NVC and because of what I mentioned early on in our conversation around the, you know, this idea of protective use of force is that I use NVC um, and my understanding of my own needs and capacities to kind of um, share with someone who's being, for example, aggressive towards me um, where my limits are. So I am not here to endure any more harm than I need to endure in this life. So it's about putting a boundary in place. So it might be, for example, that um, if someone's making a comment about me and like the size of my body or whatever, like I will let them know that like, I'm not here for that. I'm not here to hear it. I didn't ask them and I will move myself to another space. Um, I, think that NVC, uh, not I think, NVC has really helped me to kind of develop a stance, which I have also talked about as being my vocation as well, that when, for example, acts that might be labeled as microaggressions um, are done, um, you know, it's fairly common that people hold an understanding and have made choices, particularly people who come from marginalized backgrounds or people of color, um, that they don't want to be educating so-called white people around race and racism. My particular vocation is that I am willing to do that to a certain point. And that's a choice that I made for myself. And so when people do engage in those kinds of behaviors, I, my NVC skills and my holding of nonviolent consciousness allow me to be able to speak to what the impact is for me. And it allows me to engage in dialogue in which I can um, um, ask for reflection and use other tools so that I can hear from the other person that they're hearing what the impact is. In those moments, I find it's not so much important that they are acknowledging that what they said is racist or that they're racist or that they're being oppressive. What I'm wanting them to hear is that I'm a human being and that something that they have done has generated some kind of impact. And are they willing to co-hold the impact with me? Sometimes they're not, in which case, 
I may choose to separate um, if I'm not being seen by a person because that I often experience it, like that as harm. Sometimes it en engages them with some sense of curiosity that they're willing to go further with me in a conversation um, and in connection about what the impact is and um, trying to establish some set of, of agreement or expectations about what to do in the future. And so I do consider NVC as being um, in a large way responsible for me um, developing those types of skills because it does help me to find the language of being able to share what my feelings and needs are in those moments. And that's language that I didn't have accessible to me before. So that's one of the ways that I, um, that I find NVC helps with responding to racism and oppression. Mm -hmm. I'll once again ask if there's any kind of clarifying questions and I want to leave room as well for, um, uh, yeah, for, I know that uh, Kazu has some things to share, but I would love to, uh, again, invite space for any Black Indigenous, Black, Black Indigenous people, people of color um, who would like to, to speak to kind of, um, to speak into the group or to let, us, let it be known. And then I'd like to invite anyone else as well. Have I missed anything in the chat at all that you've noticed, Kazu? Just lots of resonance and appreciation for you and your mm -hmm. work, your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's open to anybody if you have any um, last questions or uh, comments or even some or resonance that you want to share. Thank you, um, Song. Grateful to be. Um, thank you. Thank you, Naming, for the compassion and presence. Um, I see uh, there's something again from uh, Liam and Jess. Liam. Hey, um, I just want to, uh, I just have something that I wanted to share. And um, I just also want to be responsible that it says Liam and Jess, but Jess is not in the room anymore. Yeah. So it's just Liam. Um, so as the person that was speaking during the time when um, somebody made the comment to stop hearing from uh, white people, um, it was so for me, that was extremely uncomfortable. I'm a Puerto Rican person who presents white. Um, so I often don't find space to speak because I'm assumed as white. And then I get yelled at for talking too much. And, uh, but also like, I don't actually have the space to speak at the same places, you know, I guess super mm -hmm. white people, cause I'm like, just like a lot white. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that that comment really impacted me um, mm -hmm. when I almost like signed off the chat and like was like mad and I talked to my girlfriend. She was like, no, just, uh, I'm sorry, my feet, sorry, boo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she was like, no, you should actually just come on when it's appropriate and, and just say something. So I don't, um, so yeah, I don't know how to uh, res just respond to that nonviolently. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let, let's explore it. I really appreciate you naming it. Um, like what I'm hearing um, in terms of what you shared around your experience is that it was incredibly disconnecting from you to the point where you felt like you um, wanted to leave and only stayed with the support of a conversation that you had with your partner. Um, and that what was uncomfortable for you is that it... Um, is that it, one, it replicates an experience that you've had before as being a light-skinned person who is um, uh, Puerto Rican and um, a, a sense of an experience of not actually having space to express yourself and also not being seen. Um, and so that's what I'm hearing is the impact on you. Does that sound accurate or is there anything more that you want me to reflect? Uh, yeah, that was very accurate. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the... Um, the invitation then I think in these moments is uh, one, I really want to acknowledge and um, name my appreciation for you coming, staying with the call and to naming um, what was uncomfortable for you. Um, and the, in terms of, you know, you, you, you said, I'm not sure how to respond to that nonviolently. And so I often invite um, that if you can, and you're, if you're in a space where you're having an impact if you can find a way to name the impact, and that might include, for example, creating the container. So it could be something like, this is really hard for me to say. Um, I just would like to get this out uh, without interruption, um, if that's possible. Um, 
to do so. And the other thing that I would invite um, that might help at this time or later, um, actually, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you have any guesses as to why the Black Indigenous People of Color request was done, do, if, if you have any guesses at all. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Look, when you see like four, five, six white people talking, you're just like, man, here's another space where I don't have the space to speak. Mm -hmm. I get that, and it builds up. But yeah. I, what I would love for people to get is like, firstly, like, you know, mixed people have a totally different experience of life than, mm -hmm. than other folks. And, um, and also like, yeah, I understand that, that that builds up over time and that the, and I absolutely see and totally respect that because I saw it, you know, I saw it as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, you know, four or five people speaking and then, but I was the one speaking when the, the comment came onto the thread and then everybody mm -hmm. jumped on like, yeah, right on, right on, right on. And I was like, wow, man, mm -hmm. I'm like the, the worst one of them all, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was my experience. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for sharing that because it's so important to have an understanding of where, what it is that we're coming from. And if we can get to that place, and that's always an invitation, we don't have to go there, of understanding where, where those requests might come from and other needs that might be met. And that in this case, what it led to was, an, um, was a gap um, that needs some warning, right? In that um, even though you recognize the need for that space, that it also in the in the way that it done landed for you in the way that was that actually created and generated some harm and so it's something for us to, to think about as holders of space um, about how it is that we can make the request recognizing it as a legitimate request um, in a way that will hold more needs and so i just appreciate your naming it and bringing it up here thank you i do see a hand raised but i want to check with kazu um, if I'm okay to um, respond to that or if we're out of time. Okay, we're good. Okay, so Indigo, if you're willing. Hi, yeah, so I, I had a couple of things um, that are coming up out of this particular conversation and also leading to what I would have said before this last mm -hmm. conversation also. Mm -hmm. So I'm just observing a few things. And so this is nothing like the absolute truth, right? This is me pondering mm -hmm. and digesting. Um, I didn't really feel like, so I didn't notice uh, that Liam was the person who was on screen when that conversation unfolded. Mm -hmm. So for me, that conversation definitely didn't relate to who was on screen right then. It was definitely a, a, mm -hmm. a broader thing. Um, mm -hmm. And my take on it was more like, oh yeah, I'm not stepping forward. <laughs> oh yeah, I am just kind of in the chat. Mm -hmm. You know, the attention can only be given to us when we put ourselves there. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of more like where it came from in me. And and, you know, there are a few things around that, like for one, I think just to be very plain about it, you know, we say BIPOC or however that said, but there is specific anti-blackness. And so mm -hmm. there's a way that I'm showing up looking for what can I learn that will help me as a black person. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about, oh, when I see racism, I use NBC like this. Okay, that interests me. And that's the conversation I'm really wanting to have today. And so there's a feeling like when people coming from other perspectives are asking questions that are pertinent to them, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like waiting, like, when do we get to the part that gives me the skills that I need to meet this world as a Black woman, mm -hmm. right? Um, in a violent country, in a country that's very violent towards me in a very small mm -hmm. body, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that and then there's also you know there's this element and I, I never say this but since we're having such a real conversation today i'm gonna say it this time um though i'm very nervous in saying it mm -hmm. but there's a way that it always lands wrong with me when people say you can put in your pronouns but they never say and you can put in your ethnicity because i am a woman of african descent but i'm also cherokee and i'm also black feet and if mm -hmm. Liam could say whatever his ethnicity was after his name, that would probably give us more information mm -hmm. about him than his pronouns, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but if the invitation was broader, like what, is, what, are, what are people getting wrong about you that mm -hmm. you would like them to have some help getting right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that is your pronouns, but maybe that's your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, to me, that's more the point, yeah. right? 
what is your, what is your hidden truth that we're going to come to the wrong conclusions if you don't have the opportunity to, to help us with it? Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for naming that because it really speaks to, and I've seen there's a lot of resonance that's happening throughout the, throughout the group. It really speaks to um, what happens when, about the space that's created in dominant culture for people who have, um, who aren't from the dominant culture, who have multiple, um, you know, kind of broad identities. And also it speaks to the impact of norms. So I can, we can both acknowledge that the naming of pronouns is a newer norm that's happened, that's actually meant to be more welcoming and inclusive. But what you're speaking to is that there are other gaps here that actually might be more helpful. And so that's great to have that information lend, and lend it to the, to the conversation for our, for our consideration because it's an invitation for how it is that we can hold care for each other. So thank you for that. And then in terms of the speaking around what it is that you were wanting or needing or more of what you found exciting about, and this is often true, is that the only way that I, um, you know, there's lots you can think about in terms of was the invitation clear or not clear or whatever. Um, but for me, the thing that I would think about as a person who is helping to facilitate this space is um, um, what more, what, what else could I do to invite people to speak to what it is that they're wanting to hear? Because one of the things that I'm trying to hold as a person um, who is the primary speaker of this space is that um, by inviting people to speak into the space, which is the only way that I, had avail that I have available to me in this moment that I can think of, is for people to speak to what it is that they're wanting. And then we can move in that, in, in that direction and help to shape what's happening in our collective time together. Um, I'm going to have to pause there because I know that I've now taken over East Point Peace Academy's time, Kaji's time. Um, I do see another raised hand there, but I'm wanting to, um, again, defer to Kazu because I really want to meet the needs that, um, that he's holding. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of just go off script here and suggest that maybe we hear one last comment from Ebony. Um, and then we have like a, a, I'll make it into like a three minute presentation just around next steps and gift economy and all that that's important. And if folks need to go, um, you're obviously welcome to, but I think this is an important enough conversation that maybe we can close with one more comment from Ebony. I'll just share a few minutes about our work and then I'll hand it back to Leone for closing comments if, that, if that's okay for everyone. Okay. And if folks right. need to go, um, you will all receive the recording as well. So. Yeah. Thank you for those who are here to drop off. Um, we'll go to you next, Ebony, and then we'll go back, go back to Kazu. Hi, thank you so much, Leone, for your work and sharing, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask this question. Um, I'm really grateful to my fellow BIPOC folks who spoke up earlier. Um, I, too, wanted to hear information about how to survive as a Black woman um, in this society, including mm. and particularly how to use NBC to connect with my fellow BIPOC. I think mm -hmm. that um, systems of oppression, and like you mentioned, Leonie, I also find myself very frequently in communities where I'm one of one or one of a few mm -hmm. people of color in the space, and I long for connection to my own folks, mm -hmm. but because of, you know, history and systems and, and where I found myself uh, placed in the larger society, I don't often come into contact with folks of color and then when I do, I feel like there's a, a gap between our, our ability to just reach out and connect because I don't have practice in that. And I hope that NBC could help me to find a way to communicate, to connect. I was curious about how you create community uh, using mm. NBC with, with our, within our own folks, especially when there are, are differences in you know, um, socioeconomic status among us and like, was mentioned before, differences in colorism and color experiences and things of, of that nature. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your comment and your question. Um, so creating space for people of color is actually um, something that I actively do. I, need, I needed to create that, that space in order for me to maintain my connection to NBC community. I have an organization which I co-founded with another woman of color called POC for NBC. And we can we can you can find us at POC for NBC at org. I'm going to share the um, URL. Um, and also, I have an organization called the Thoughtful Workplace, 
Um, so I really would invite you to check out the website, pocfornvc.org. It's an organization for people in NVC or nonviolent communities who identify as uh, people from the global majority or black indigenous people of color. Um, and we have um, monthly calls and other events uh, that are specifically for BIPOC folks. Um, and I'll also share that I have a that the Thoughtful Workplace, which is another place where um, some of my offerings are available and I can be reached. Um, so those are some of the, that's what I can offer as a, as a resource for now. Thank you. Over to you, Kazu. Thank you. Um, and just kind of following some of the, the, the chat, uh, I guess there is a way to save the transcript for anyone who was commenting about that and missed that. So thank you for whoever uh, showed us the way. So um, thank you, Leone, and thank you to everyone on the call. I know this is like, you know, we're not going to heal all of the <laughs> issues of, of white supremacy on this call. And, there's, you know, I say that half jokingly and also ha half with some mourning um, because it's, it's about time, right? It's 500 years, I think, is, is, is plenty long enough. Um, but just want to, you know, continue to live into the acceptance of what we are capable of doing and continue to live into the complexity of all of it. Uh, I've been sitting a lot with this uh, Jain teaching of Anikantavada, which speaks to like multiple truths, that my truth can be 100% true and your truth is also 100% truth and, and it's not a zero sum game. So we all bring so many truths and so many needs and, and it can become a really complex thing um, and part of our practice is to be able to hold that complexity. Um, I just wanna share very briefly, um, and because we're out of time, I'm actually not even gonna share the slides, but as many of you know, at the East Point Peace Academy, one of the ways that we try to live into our commitment of nonviolence is uh, our practices and our commitment to the gift economy. And that means many things for us. Part of what that means is uh, since our founding in 2013, we've probably had over 10,000 people come through our various programs and we've never charged a single dime. And we always put the work first. We always put relationship first. We oftentimes do projects that end up costing us money on the back end um, because we know that the work is more important than anything. And we believe that if we put the work first, then if it's work that's meant to be sustained, then our community will come together to sustain it. And so rather than charging people a fee to attend any of our programs, we like to uh, offer an invitation to anyone who feels called to support our work to not think about like, oh, how much was this program worth it to you? Because this program was a gift from Leone and a gift from us to you all. It's already been paid for by the people that came before you. So how much would you like, how much would it give you joy to support our programs going forward, knowing that other people can benefit from this kind of work, knowing that the majority of our work that we do is with incarcerated communities who can't pay for it, with high schools who can't pay for it. Um, and so I want to invite everyone and you'll receive this in an email as well. Uh, there's a link on our website. If you go to eastpointpeace.org backslash Leone donate, any donations that are given through that particular link, we'll be able to track so we know what to share with Leone. Um, Leone was also kind enough to, to offer this uh, workshop on a gift economy with no guarantee of any particular amount. Um, and so we wanna make sure that her work is supported um, and that her work is sustained as well. So if you do feel called, um, there's a beautiful quote that comes from Marshall Rosenberg actually who created nonviolent communication who says that uh, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And we oftentimes show a picture of a young boy feeding a duck. And to just ask yourself who gets more joy out of that interaction, the little boy or the duck. And that's the kind of image that we want you to sit with as you think about would it make you happy to support our work, to support Leone's work? And what does generosity look like to you? And so we want to offer that uh, invitation for generosity and reciprocity to you all. And you'll receive this link in your email as well as some additional resources as well as links to Leone's work. Um, and then uh, in about a week or so, once this video has been edited and uploaded, you'll receive the link to that as well. So thank you all for participating with us. I'll turn it back over to Leone for any closing comments. And then I want to invite everyone to unmute themselves and to just shower Leone with our gratitude before we hop off. All right. Thank you so much, Kazu. Thank you, East Point Peace Academy. Thank you all for your contributions. This is really a, a very lively, fruitful, and um, great discussion. 
I um, I've shared some links if you want to stay in connection um, with me. And I just want to really invite you all to, um, yeah, to get in touch. And also that if you find yourself struggling in these spaces, to keep looking, that there are people who can receive you regardless of 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 who you are, that there are people who can receive you, who welcome you and uh, and your full humanity. So we keep trying. NBC is worth it, not while it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you all. So I invite everyone to unmute themselves now and just shower Leone with our appreciation and we will close with that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Leone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.